Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the ICRC service uh, on this beautiful sunny day. It's so good to be able to worship with everyone uh, as a church family. Uh, let's begin with our call to worship. Please respond uh, in the blue bolded words. God of wondrous signs and miracles. Adequate to be called by you. Yet your fire relentlessly pursues us. You empower us for your mighty works. Our words, our songs of praise come from you. Today we praise your name and declare who you are, the great I am. Let's stand and worship God together. Give thanks. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise. Sing praise. With a mighty hand. With a mighty hand. And thou stretched on. Love endures forever For the life that's been reborn It's love endures forever Sing praise Sing praise Sing praise Sing praise His love endures forever, and by the grace of God, we will carry on. His love endures forever, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, forever. God from me. 
mercy rage.
be exalted. Be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place. You alone deserve our praise. You're the name above all names. Be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place. You alone deserve our praise. You're the name above all names. Be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place. You alone deserve our praise. You're the name above all names. Be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place. You alone deserve our praise. You're the name. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name. Jesus, you deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name. Jesus, you deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Sing it one last time. Worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Amen. Uh, you may have a seat. And now uh, we'll move on to our catechism. How does God's word command us to relate to the person of the Holy Spirit? The fruit, fruit of, of the Spirit, Spirit is love, joy, peace, peace patience, patience, kindness, kindness goodness, goodness, faithfulness, faithfulness gentleness, gentleness, and self-control. Self and now, a uh, time of prayer, confession, and intercession. Almighty Father, we confess that at times our doubts and fears override our hope and faith. Forgive, Forgive us, us when, when we, we lose, lose sight of the joy of your love, of your love and, and fall into despair when we when wander, wander far from you. Lift up our spirits, Lord, and help us to remember the promise of new life here, and now through your Son, Jesus. Restore us or renew us that we might reflect your grace, mercy, and compassion to those around us. In the name of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Let's have a time of silent prayer. Let's recite the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. In the book of Psalm, Chapter 23, verse 4, it says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And now we have a few announcements. Uh, so a reminder again that Kids Connect Salt and Yaf are on summer break, and it will resume... Uh, September 5th for Kids Connect, and SALT will resume on uh, September 6th. And the church family retreat is uh, slowly coming up. Uh, it's going to be held at 
uh, Camp Karis, and it's happening from August 30th to September 1st. So I believe, yeah, there, it's still early bird. Um, today is the last day. Oh, today's the last day, actually. So if you haven't signed up, make sure you quickly sign up to get the early bird rate. And um, yeah, it's going to be, the registration is from uh, June 16th until August 11th. And the Kids Praise Dance is back, and we are inviting kids from ages 7 to 12 to join us in September. Uh, if you want more details, please email programs at icrc.ca. And I believe the kids can now, oh, nope, sorry. It's now our favorite time of the service. It's time to uh, pass the peace of Christ to one another. So I'll give you a couple of minutes to uh, greet one another beside you, greet one another on the other side of the room, and just catch up with one another. Thirty more seconds. Okay, ten seconds to get back to your seat. Okay, and okay, now the kids, you guys can go up to Sunday school. So now we come to a time of uh, tithes and offerings. Uh, if you feel uh, if you want to give, uh, please send an interact e-transfer to give at icrc.ca, or you can drop off a physical check here at church as well. Uh, let's come to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we bring forth to you uh, this offering with humble hearts and acknowledge, God, that you provide us with everything that we have, God. And we just want... Uh, we ask God for wisdom in uh, using these funds, God, to further your kingdom and to use it according to your will. May you continue to help us be generous like how you are generous to us. Continue, we continue to ask for your love and your care upon us. In Jesus' name we pray.
Amen. And I want to call up Jamie now for our scripture reading, uh, followed by the sermon preached by Pastor Vic. Oops, sorry. Our passage today is taken from Exodus 6, verses 1 to 9, and I'm reading from the ESV version. But the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh, for with a strong hand he will send them out, and with a strong hand he will drive them out of this land. God spoke to Moses and said to him, I'm the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name the Lord I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they lived as sojourners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the people of Israel, whom the Egyptians hold as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, and I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. Moses spoke thus to the people of Israel, but they did not listen to Moses because of their broken spirit and harsh slavery. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Jamie, for reading the scripture for us today. I want to wish all of you a warm welcome to Emmanuel CRC. Thank you for taking time to join us either here in person or online. Community is a very important part of the life of the church. Uh, and I just want to shout out to our Penta Sport team. So we've joined a church sports league. All right, it's called Penta Sports. And this year we won something. <laughs> Hey, we almost got, we almost got the, this award last year, okay, so, so no laughing. Um, we won the most spirited award, all right? Uh, the most spirited team is the, te the team with the most team spirit, you know? It, it's not the team that kind of, uh, 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 you know, reacts in anger when they don't win or whatever. It's the team that's gracious, that's kind, that, you know, expresses the love of Christ to each one. And of all the championship trophies that, I, that are available, this is the one that I would have wished that we would have won. And we did. All right? Not everyone on the team is represented in this photo, obviously, uh, but we, we are grateful for every one of you who are involved in our Pentaspot Tuesday evening. Besides that, we just finished our Camp Transformers retreat. It took some time uh, to go to Camp Luther, three days, Monday to Wednesday, in the middle of that summer heat wave. Today, when the wind blows across, it's cool, but back in those, in those, early in this week, you know, when the wind blew across, it was warm, it was hot. But you know what? We survived. And if temperature is any gauge of what was going on, I tell you, the spiritual temperature is going up. The spiritual temperature amongst our next generation in the youth, in the young adults, it's going up. It's going up by the grace of God. I'm happy to report that we had eight decisions, uh, both salvation and rededication. Those were the ones I saw. Perhaps there were more. But by the grace of God, you know, the faith that He has placed in our hearts, this will be passed on generation to generation. Today, our sermon will look at um, Exodus chapters 5 to 10. But before we start, I'd like to open us with a word of prayer. God, we thank you that you are a God who calls us. You are a God who reveals himself to us and redeems us for yourself. This is who you are. Open our eyes this day that we might see you high and lifted up. High and lifted up in your word. High and lifted up in the scriptures. High and lifted up in our hearts. We ask that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you this day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going a little fast, all right? Some of you are wondering. We, we, we kind of try to do one chapter a week, and it's like, Pastor, why are we going through so many chapters? 
Well, um, the Chinese service or the Mandarin service has been doing Bible study and they did Exodus over one year. So, you know, the, the staff, we were discussing, should we take another year to do Exodus? You know, so we came to a compromise. We'll try to move a little quicker, uh, perhaps covering this in the next three months or so. Um, but still, we'll attend to the main themes. And the main themes of Exodus are revelation and redemption. Revelation and redemption. So that's also today's sermon title. Revelation, who is God? Redemption, what is He doing? Very often people are concerned only about what God is doing, about the redemptive work, and are not so concerned about revelation, about who He is. But today we're going to see that both these things are important. God reveals Himself to Moses and to the people. God saves them in dramatic fa fashion. That's the, the, the book of Exodus in a nutshell. You know, if you were to skip, for example, the book of Exodus and go from Genesis to Leviticus, you will find yourself in the midst of sin and sacrifice, but no salvation. Exodus is that one book of the Old Testament, is the one book in the five books of the Torah that speak about God's great salvation. If in the future, uh, from where Exodus is, if in the future the prophets will talk about God's great salvation, they will always refer to Exodus, how God saved a people who were not a people, how God took a people who were slaves, how God took out the Pharaoh who was, you know, the king of Egypt, uh, a superpower in its day, slaves against superpower, and how God remarkably and miraculously took them out of slavery. If anyone were to think about God's salvation in the Old Testament, it would be in the book of Exodus. It is also focused on the theme of redemption. Now, I've, I've always said this, and I'll repeat this every time we start a sermon series. The Bible has four main themes. It goes through creation, fall, new cre uh, sorry, creation, fall, redemption, and new creation. These are four themes that are present in every book of the Bible, but there will be some emphases, right? Some books will have certain emphases. So, for example, Genesis will be focused on creation. Exodus. Well, we will see create. We'll see all themes in every book, right? We saw creation. We saw uh, the fall. We saw redemption. We saw hints of the new creation. But in Exodus, the focus of the book of Exodus is redemption. How does God save His people? If Genesis was focused on how God saved a family through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Exodus is focused on how God saves an entire nation. God saves. Against impossible odds, God saves. So, in, in their time, Pharaoh and Egypt were like the superpower of its day. All right? uh, in an agricultural society where everything you know, is dependent on, let's say, uh, human uh, work uh, and maybe some animals to participate. You don't have machines, you don't have you know, anything that's fueled by, by, by um, oil and, and things like that then if your land is agriculturally fertile, you win. You win. While others are going through famines and your country is stable, you win. Napoleon says armies fight on their bellies, armies fight on their stomachs. And what he means is that regardless of the technology that you have, if the army has no food, it can't fight. And Egypt was the breadbasket, not just of its region, but of the world. There's this fertile Nile that runs through the continent. Well, not through the continent, but at least half the continent, right? Long river branches out at the end into a delta. If you look at satellite photographs of that region, there is a fertile crescent or a fertile triangle and then green all around the river, right? And that was the source of its power in its day. It was one of the superpowers. These people that God is addressing, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they are nobodies in this land. They are slaves. They're not even second-class citizens. They have no rights. As far as the Pharaoh's concerned, they are his machines. They are his robots. They would work if he, de if he desires that they work. And if he so chooses to give them rest, so they shall rest. Against impossible odds, God does impossible deeds to accomplish an impossible salvation. 
through the plagues, through the Passover, through the parting of the Red Sea, through pillars of cloud and fire, through the provision of food and water in the midst of the desert, God saves His people. That's the book of Exodus. It's that singular book in the Old Testament that talks about God's great deliverance. And if Israel should ever forget what that looks like, they can read Exodus. They can read especially the first 15 chapters of Exodus to see what God's salvation looks like. You see, the book of Exodus is important both in the order of history, salvation history, and in the order of the books of the Bible. Because it tells us, before service and sacrifice, there is salvation. It's not as if God chose a group of people because they were so obedient, they were following after Him, they did all things right, everything got checked off, all right, now I will save you. The order of salvation is not service and then salvation. The order of salvation is salvation unto service. Right? That's why Exodus is there before the other books. In the order of salvation history, it will not be that anyone so pleases God in what they do in all of their lives that God says, oh, well done, now you get to go into heaven, now you get eternal life. It is while we were yet mired deep in sin, God reaches out and He saves. Before they've done anything good, God saves them in the midst of their brokenness. And if you're listening here today, either online or in person, and you're wondering if you're good enough to go to a church service, if you're good enough to attend a church service online, I've got news for you. None of us here are good enough in our own right. We are sinners saved by grace. We are sinners saved by the wondrous grace of Jesus Christ. That saving work that God has done, we are present here to worship Him as a response to that wonderful work. So all are welcome. All are welcome. To a people who ought to know but have forgotten God, He reveals Himself. To a people who were called into covenant with God but found themselves deep in slavery, He redeems. And then there is the human response. All right? This is the order of salvation. All right? I put it up as a slide. Sometimes I just say it and I don't put it up as a slide, but I put it up as a slide so that you know how important. Revelation precedes everything. Anything that we know about God, anything at all, it's been revealed to us through His Word. Right? We wouldn't know God if He didn't reveal Himself to us. That's why that precedes everything. And before we ever had, even had a chance to do anything right, He redeems. He sets out His plan of salvation so that all that we do on a Sunday, on a Monday, all the way to a Saturday, all that we do throughout the week is a response to that great salvific work that He has done for us. Today, we're going to focus on Exodus chapters 5 to 10 to see God's revelation and redemption. Feel free to, we're going to go at a, quite a clip, so feel free to refer to your Bibles, whether, you know, hard copy or, or online. Um, you know, if you have apps, Bible apps, feel free to, to look through the text as we are going through it. The summary of Exodus chapter 5 is that Aaron and Moses, they go up to the Pharaoh, they say, all right, you know, you've got to let God's people go. God's people are not designed only to work. They're designed to work and worship. Let them go to worship the Lord. And Pharaoh's like, nope. Who who are you? Well, I recognize you, Moses, because my daughter adopted you. I don't know this other guy. Who are you all? Who are you all to tell me to let go of, you know, this machine that I've built? They are producing bricks for the marvelous constructions that I'm constructing here in Egypt, who are you? Who is speaking? In, in fact, Pharaoh not only uh, refuses to do as Moses suggests, Pharaoh actually says, let's make them build, make bricks, continue to make bricks, but let's not provide straw. Right? Let's 
not provide one of the key building materials, but they have to do the same work. So they have to, now they have to gather straw and make the same bricks. And it's not that we reduce the quota. Oh yeah, you know, I, I'm, I'm aware that your workload has increased, so I'm going to cut back here and there. Your quotas will be halved. No, 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 no. The quotas remain the same, so it's more work. Um, more work. No worship. We are not friends. We are not machines. And I'm not sure the working situation they are in. Some of us are, you know, in good work situations where there's this work-life balance and, you know, people know their limits. But I find that in some working situations, people see other people as machines, right? And that if that's you, for example, then you find yourself working a bit more than you want to, a bit longer hours than you want to, you find that tasks are accruing to you uh, without, you know, any kind of consideration for rest. But we are not machines. We're not only made for work. We're not only machines to do someone's bidding. We are made also to worship. Look at the foreman or the Israelite uh, overseers, so to speak. All right? So, you know, there, there will be the Egyptian overlords, Pharaoh right at the top. Over the workforce, the Israelite workforce, there were overseers. Look at the worldview of the overseers. They've kind of bought into Pharaoh's worldview, right? You say, you shall buy no... They met, they met Moses and Aaron, and they said, the Lord look on you and judge, because you have made us a stink in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants. You have put a sword in their hand to kill us. They've bought into this worldview, made for work, not for worship. Machines, not humans. They've adopted the Pharaoh's mindset. They're so concerned about what Pharaoh thinks. They're so concerned with the workload. Now the workload has, has increased. Look what you've done. You know, this is what happens after a long exposure to competing worldviews. So that after a while, you get caught up in the red race. The only time that God is mentioned is, you know, when they are cursing Moses. All right, the, the Lord look on you and judge. But in all other ways, God is not uh, referred to, not thought about. It is only the work. They've bought into the worldview. This is what happens when we get caught in a red race. And I know these are real things that we're facing, all right? Um, Housing prices here in Richmond, here in the Lower Mainland, no joke, right? Especially if you, you um, account for wages that we get here in the Lower Mainland uh, versus the housing price. I think we are at least top 10, maybe even top 5, uh, depending on which study you read. So I know that this is the rat race or, or the desire to accumulate and to, to, to earn money. That's a real thing, right? Housing here is expensive. But I want to say this, in the midst of this uh, competing for um, living space, you were not made only to work. You were made also to worship. Perhaps it might be harder. Perhaps it might be difficult as we give up one day in a week to worship corporately, as we take time in our week in the other six days to worship. Perhaps that would take something away from your work. But you're designed to worship. They're designed to have that communion and that communication with God on a daily basis, and not just once in a while. But the Israelite overseers, they have bought in to the worldview. So even when we start off in the book of Exodus, in the story of Exodus, the people of God are not covering themselves in glory. Right? It's revelation, redemption, response, right? It's not like they had a very good response to begin with and then God's like, yeah, great. Right? Even at the beginning, they hardly care about God. They might invoke the name of God, but they really only care about Pharaoh, the political leadership of Egypt, and the work they are made to do. In fact, Moses himself wavers. There's not enough space on this slide, but Moses says to God, Oh Lord, why have you done this evil to this people? Why did you ever send me? 
Since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people. You have not delivered your people at all. All of God's promises are in future tense. And all of Moses' experience up till now, at the end of chapter 5, is in past tense. And in the past tense, he says, you have not delivered. Some of us are caught in, the te- in between the tenses of God's promise and our experience of it. Some of us are caught this way. All right? And as we go through the sermon, I, I, I want you to see, I want you to see that there is a way in which we can rest in the person of God as His promises are being worked out in our lives. But for Moses here at the end of chapter 5, also not covering himself in glory, also, you know, saying these things to God, why have you done this to the people? But God says to Moses, the Lord says, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh, for with a strong hand he will send them out. Strong hand he will drive them out of his land. God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. Here in the first two verses is revelation. All right? Revelation of a certain kind. It's a revelation not of destination. It's a revelation of a person. Yes, you see in the future tense what will happen, what God will do, what He will cause Pharaoh to do. You will see that in the future tense. But in the present tense, God declares, I am the Lord. I am the Lord. God's person, His character will back up all that He's going to say. Redemption is not a destination. Redemption is a person. It's not simply a set of events that will happen. Redemption is premised in the person of God. He will save. He is the Redeemer. He will save. He is the Deliverer. He will deliver. He will restore. He will bring all things into being that He's promised and He will renew all things so that even in the here and now, in your present If you do not experience the redemptive work of God, you have to first encounter the Redeemer. You have to first know the Redeemer. Even if you don't experience the redemptive work of God, even if you don't understand the work of His hands, you have to understand and encounter the desire of His heart. To know Him, to know His heart, which is for you, which is towards you this day. In the midst of Moses' doubt, God reveals Himself. Redemption is not about a where or a what. Redemption is first and foremost about a who. That's, that's how chapter 6 begins. But in verse 9, the people did not listen. All right, so here this passage takes us to the end of verses uh, 1 to 8. But in verse 9, feel free to check your Bibles, the people did not listen. It says, it did not listen because of their broken spirit and harsh slavery. Their broken spirit and harsh slavery. Don't tell me about God. Moses, don't tell me about all these promises. Do you, know, do you not know where I am right now? I wake up really early. I'm making bricks all day. I hardly get to eat. And I go to bed really late and really tired. Today, because of what you've done, I'm going to wake up earlier to collect some straw. And then I'm going to do what I have been doing all this time. Do you know where I am, Moses? I have no time to think about God. As it is, because of the demands of work, I already feel spent, used up, broken. Do you know where I am, Moses? I can't hear you. I can't hear your declarations of this God who reveals Himself and redeems. I can't hear it because of my broken 
Spirit. That's where they were at. God, you say all these things, but I'm not feeling it right now. My life does not look like that right now. In fact, this is what it looks like. God, my spirit is broken. I'm experiencing the harshness of life. I'm enslaved to my projects and my passions. This is how I'm feeling. Now pause there for a moment. Pause there for a moment. If you were God, what would you do? I mean, you know, I thank, thank God that, I, thank the Lord that I'm not God. Uh, but if in the midst of this great revelation, in the midst of God working out His redemptive purpose, if I was faced with people like the ones that God was faced with here, I might judge them. You know, I might say, oh, yeah, maybe I'll pick another people. These people don't seem so great. You know, oh, these people seem so full of themselves. They're not able to hear. But God doesn't, does He? In fact, he, com he continues to remember the covenant that He's made with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. The remembrance of God is the outworking of the faithful character of God. So He remembers. It is not something that was said and then, you know, uh, Playfully said and playfully forgotten as if God were to be fickle, but He's not. He's not fickle. He's faithful and He remembers that which was said tens of years ago, hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and He is faithful. If you feel like how the Israelites feel today, I'm here to remind you about person of God. God opens and closes His speech with a declaration of who He is, right? I am the Lord. This is the technical term for this if you are taking notes. It's an inclusio. So like inclusion but without the letter N. An inclusio is a way to highlight things of importance. It's a repetition that frames the beginning and end. This is important speech so pay attention, right? In the past, there was, there, we, we can't change the color of the text. You know, there was no, no, no ability to bold, make things in bold, right? Because they were carving onto stone, words onto stone. Um, and so in order to bring attention to a particular thing that was very important, it would be repeated. And if it's repeated in the form of an inclusio, then it's saying, Everything in between is related to these two statements that frame the front and end. This is important, people. Pay attention. So today we're going to pay some attention to some of these promises. These precious declarations of God over His people. God would say, I am the Lord. I am the Lord. These things are going to be happening as you are being redeemed. There will be events that will either blow your mind or it will be staggering to simply imagine. But know this, that God is at the center of all that's happening. Not your oppressor, not your lived experience. God is in the center of what's going on. And how precious are these declarations. I will take you to be my people. This is a declaration of adoption. Adoption. A people who did not originally belong to God. A people who were perhaps estranged from God. If any of you have been involved in adoption, you will, you'll know how precious is it that moment when you sign the papers. How precious it is when you first bring that child home. This is adoption. He's declaring over a people who might have forgotten about Him, people who were in covenant with Him but have forgotten, people who have strayed away from Him, people who have taken different paths in life. And He's declaring over all these people, I will take you as my people. Adoption. You do not belong to Pharaoh as a slave. That's not who you are. You are part of the family of God. You belong to God as His children. Not a machine, 
a son and a daughter of the Most High. That's adoption. You shall know that I am the Lord, your God. This is revelation, but of a certain specific kind. Very often we think of revelation as something to do with my mind only, something to experience in my head, like a set of facts, a list of things I can recite. But this is not just head knowledge. You shall know that I am the Lord, your God. You shall know me personally, and I will be your God. You will be my people. Not just a head knowledge, a relational knowledge. Not just an assortment of facts. Your God. This is why when I talk about the retreat and the decisions that were made at the retreat, I choke up. All of me is rejoicing. All of me is celebrating the fact that people have responded positively. I want to be in relationship with God. I want my life to be transformed. That which was not there in my heart from before, God can put it in there. The love, the joy, the peace that comes from Him, that which was not there before, He can transform my heart. And so when I talk about it, I choke up. Because God is doing, has been doing, and I thank Him for His work. He's been doing that kind of revelatory work, a specific kind. Not a kind that only stays in your head, but a kind in which your heart is also drawn to, connected to, knowing God as your God. That kind of revelation. And there is redemption. There is redemption. I have brought, you will know that I have brought you. This hasn't happened yet, but you will know that I am that one that has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. This is what a saving will look like. This is what a redemption will look like. You will be able to work, but you will also be able to worship. You will not be second class. You will be children of the Most High. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. This is what the Lord says. In the midst of a superpower that is overshadowing their lives, in the midst of an oppression that that they cannot cast off, they have no weapons of their own, they have no technology of their own, and they're certainly not trained to fight. They're trained to make bricks. In the midst of all of that, God is going to redeem them. And I will emplace you I will bring you into the land that I saw to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will give you a home and placement. I will give you a home. These declarations are situated in the faithfulness of God. This is the character. This is the person of God. This is who He is. And these things He's going to bring to pass. I am the Lord. It's just a slight problem though. If you're going through chapter 6 to 10, small problem. The ruler of one of the most powerful nations of the earth at that time, Pharaoh, refuses. He's like, talk to the hand. You know, who are you? I, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I'm the guy in charge. I, I will say things and I will bring them to pass who is this that Moses proclaims? I, I've spoken about how Egypt was a world superpower at its time, right? So even when he meets with uh, kings and uh, monarchs, he will probably be greater in power to many kings. You probably have to go north and east for quite a bit, maybe a couple thousand kilometers before you hit the next nation uh, that will be similar in size and scope to Egypt. The slight problem, the ruler doesn't want to have anything to do with God's declaration. So begins a divine battle. And all those chapters, actually, we're not covering chapter 11 today, but all those chapters from 6 to 11 are a divine battle. 
It starts with staffs, sticks. Sticks that, a stick that God had given to Aaron. If he would lay it down, it would become a serpent. If you pick it up, it would become a stick again. And they have a divine battle. The Egyptians will bring their mag magicians and they will throw sticks to the ground, you know, and Aaron will throw his and we'll see who wins. Of course, you know the story. Here it goes. Aaron's staff wins, right? All the other serpents are gobbled up by Aaron's serpent. You would think that that, that would be enough, right? You would think that, okay, you know, divine battle over. All right, all right. You know, surely God must be with this, these people. Let's, let's uh, change our minds. But his heart was hardened and he would not listen. So God begins to, oh, it's a little small, sorry. So God begins to visit plagues upon Egypt, all right? He will turn the river Nile into blood. There will be uh, plagues of frogs, gnats, insects. There will be pestilence that falls on the livestock. Boils, hail, locusts, darkness, pass over. I say this is a divine battle because... Um, each of these things, so it's to us in, in the modern day, we, are, we look at this list and we're like, oh wow, this looks really bad, but oh, you know, whatever, right? Like it just looks like a list of disasters. But actually, the Egyptian gods, they thought, I mean, I put gods in open inverted commas because they're false gods. The Egyptians assigned to some of these uh, beings that they worshipped various characteristics and various functions. All right, so for example, Hapi, Sothis, Knum, they're associated with the river Nile. When God turns the river into blood, He's saying, these gods are not in charge. Who is Hapi? Who is Sothis? Who is Knum? No one. I'm in charge. I'm in charge. The river Nile is that source of their national strength, wealth, food, everything. Right? And God in the first uh, play is telling them, I'm in charge, but they won't listen. So a second plague, a plague of frogs. The Egyptians have a god, Hecate. Uh, this god is often portrayed with a frog's head. And God is saying, Hecate is not in charge. Geb is uh, associated with the earth. And when the lice or the gnats come out of the dust of the earth, he's saying, this god is not in charge. Wachit is the goddess of the marsh, uh, and she's associated with flies. When there's a plague of flies, Uachit is not in charge. Hathor is not in charge. Isis is not in charge. Nut is not in charge. Thermuthis is not in charge. Ra and Aton, uh, the national gods of Egypt, by the way, Ra especially, the national god of the sun, he's not in charge. When there's darkness that falls over the land, Osiris and Anubis, gods of life and death, in the Passover, they are not in charge. This was like a dance-off. You know what a dance-off is? I can't dance, but you know what a dance-off is? You have two people, right? And then one person, you know, does a couple of moves and at the end of it, he points to the other guy and the other guy will like do a couple of moves and people will evaluate the dance-off, right? They'll say like, oh, that one was so good. That one was so, so, but oh, I really like that one, right? Except in this divine dance-off, there's one person doing all the things and the other person is totally, absolutely still. God is doing all of these things and the Egyptian gods have no response. It's like a, a, a rap battle, a rap battle, you know, where, where two people are kind of battling uh, with various words and lyrics, phrases and so on. It's like a rap battle and one person is brilliant and lyrical and the other person is absolutely silent. Not a word. There is no one that compares with God. There's no one whose span of control compares with God. Even if these so-called gods were real, their spans of control limited. One area, one specific phenomenon. But these gods weren't even present as God was visiting these plagues. But each time, Pharaoh refused to let God's people go. Actually, three times he relents. I'm just going to focus on one. But three times he relents. In each chapters 7, 8, and 9, the moment that God 
removes the plagues, the moment there's relief, he changes his mind again. Right? So for this one we'll see um, after the hail, he'll say, I have sinned. The Lord, referring to Yahweh, the Lord your God is in the right and I and my people are in the wrong. He will say this. And it sounds, it sounds good. It sounds good. It sounds like this is the beginning. This could be the beginning of something new. This could be the beginning of how Pharaoh turns and allows the people of God to worship God. Maybe this could be the beginning for Pharaoh to himself turn to God, to stop taking the, the place of oppressor and to also respond to God's call. But no. No, he... When Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunder had ceased, he sinned yet again. He hardened his heart, he and his servants. I want to tell you, friends, that there is a gap between regret and repentance. All right? There's a gap between regret and repentance. Regret is feeling sorry for what you have done or experiencing the outcomes and the consequences of what you have done and taking a pause. That's regret. Repentance is turning around and saying, I'm not going this way anymore. So if you are walking in a certain direction, right? If you are walking, imagine in your spiritual life, in your relationship with God, if you are walking a particular way, not, not towards God but away from God, regret is the point where you stop and you go, Hmm, this way doesn't seem great. I'm experiencing quite a bit of things and hmm, I wonder if this is the best way to go. Pharaoh came to the point of regret. He paused. He paused three times, once in Exodus 7, once in Exodus 8, and here for the third time in Exodus 9. He pauses, but he does not turn. To turn is to repent. To turn is to say, I'm sorry for what I have done. I regret all of this. I regret looking at humans as machines, not made in the image of God. I regret forcing them to work and not allowing them to worship. I am turning. God, would you forgive me? God, would you draw me closer to yourself? God, would you allow me to experience you, your revelation, not just in my mind, but a relationship in my heart? That is repentance. There is a gap between regret and repentance. Pharaoh gets to regret, but he doesn't come to repentance. I'm going to leave the Passover for next week. But if, if I said earlier on that redemption is not an event, but is a person, if redemption is not an event, but a person, then our response should also not be events but involve our whole person. Our repentance should not just be one time. Our turning away from sin towards God should not be a one-time event, but it should be all of our lives as we are walking. We should continually be orientating towards God, walking towards Him. It should encompass not just our words, but our actions. It should encompass our thoughts and our deeds. It should encompass our character and our lives. All of who we are. If redemption is a person, the person of God, if redemption is found in God, then our response has to be that of a whole person as well. We go from I have sinned to I'm turning my life around to follow God. Revelation and redemption. God reveals Himself, not just as God, but God in relation to you, your God. God will be your Father. God will be your Lord. God will be your Master and your Saviour relating to you in adoption. You who were not His people before, He calls you to be His people. He takes you to be 
His people, He adopts you. You who were once estranged from Him, He calls you son. He calls you daughter, children. God not only reveals Himself, God redeems. God redeems us from the slavery of sin. Sin has this way of getting a hold of us. Sin has this way of corrupting us, taking something which was really good and turning it such that our experience of it is extremely bad. Sin has that way of turning us away from God. Sin has that power of keeping us in bondage so that we are addicted and we find ourselves unable to get free from the clutches of sin. And if in Exodus, the oppressor, you know, is Pharaoh, I think here, today, 2024, our oppression is that of sin. Still is. But just as God has revealed Himself in various ways, so I'm here to declare to you that He adopts you. God adopts you this day. God reveals Himself to you in a personal way this day. God redeems you and calls you out of darkness into His marvellous light. That in Jesus Christ, in the person of Christ, fully divine yet fully human, He paid the price we could not pay. When He gave up His life on the cross, He gave it up for you and I, saying on the cross, Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. He stood in our place. For this purpose was the Son of God made manifest to destroy the works of the evil one, to destroy the oppression of sin. From that moment and for all time, all the power of sin is broken. The power of sin, the power to enslave is broken. For anyone who would turn to Jesus and would respond to Him and say, this is my life, take my life, at that moment and with that declaration, God comes in, the Spirit of God comes in, changes your life from the inside out, redeems you for Himself. And in God, He gives you His home. You, he emplaces you in the body of Christ, in the church. You have a place to belong. You have a place you can call your own. In fact, you have, you have a place in which you can call or you are called God's own. You have a place to belong together. This is God. This is the one who declares, I am the Lord. And all those precious declarations within it. He set you free. Will you acknowledge Him as your Lord and your God? I want to invite you to stand. And as the team comes forward to help us to worship, we're going to sing the song, No Longer Slaves. I invite you to respond to Him.
split the sea. You split the sea so I could walk right through it. My fears were drowned in perfect love. You rescued me so I could stand and sing. I am a child of God. Sing out again. you to raise your arms in a posture of reception as I speak the benediction over you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace that you might receive the revelation of God, your God, and respond to his great redemption, to love Him with your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. Blessings are pronounced this day in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. We'll take some time for a moment of silent reflection before we move from here.
Wow.